Good afternoon and good morning to some classrooms. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Borowski. I will be your host for today. And all this month, we've been celebrating amazing women in science, adventure, exploration, and conservation. It's been a blast so far. We have a whole bunch more hangouts to come. My name is Joe Borowski. But I'm really excited today, today to be joined month, we've been by a friend of mine, Grace Young. Grace is a newly named National Geographic Emerging Explorer. She spent the summer working at NASA's Frontier Development Lab, creating 3D models of asteroids. She's an avid sailor and diver. She's been participating in marine expeditions on many continents, I think four in total so far. Some of her work includes helping to design, build, and test submersible and aerial uh, robots. In 2014, she was an aquanaut on Fabian Cousteau's Mission 31, living and working on the ocean floor for two weeks, which is pretty darn cool. Grace, it's absolutely great to see you today and to have you here to share some of your exciting adventures with our classrooms. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Well, um, so yeah, I am an ocean explorer, and but right now I'm sitting in an office in the middle of Kansas, and I'm <laughs> curious um, what you all think I might be doing here, but um, I'll explain at the end. I'll keep it as a surprise until the end of the presentation. So today I'm going to share some of my favorite moments from my from the last couple years um, building technology to help us explore the ocean. And then I'll say why I'm in Kansas and then um, I can't wait to hear all of your questions at the end. So I have, have some photos time. to help tell the story. Um, I thought I'd go back to the very kind of beginning of my of my story. I grew up in Ohio and I did a lot of ballet dancing. I danced ballet up until I was 17. I danced in a pre-professional company and at the same time though I was taking a lot of math and, and science classes. Those were my favorite classes um, and it seems like an odd mix, math and science and ballet, but I'm not the only one. There's been others from the company that I was in that had the same blend. And I found that actually the type of thinking you do in art and in engineering are quite similar. So there's been a few overlaps. I have here a photo I'll share from my time as, yeah. as a ballet dancer. You're in the front row. Um, let's see. Mm, one second, I'm going to share my screen. You're at the back and you sit yeah, on Yeah, so that was me um, several years ago. That was, this was before I started studying engineering at MIT. Um, but like I said, actually the thought processes I find are a lot of overlap. And I want to say this too, because you can get into engineering and undergrad and university from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, for me, also, I, my upbringing was somewhat unusual in that um, in Ohio, my family had this chocolate factory that my great grandfather started. And so I was surrounded by machines that wrapped in molded chocolate. And so that gave me a mechanical mindset, I think, as a young age. But then also my high school had started a robotics team. It was FIRST and VEX Robotics. I competed in the robotics team. As soon as I joined that, I was just enthralled. I absolutely loved building stuff, designing and testing stuff, which is pretty much what I do now. So this is a video of me dancing at the bottom of the ocean. This is from one of my favorite times ever. I was living underwater for 15 days as an aquanaut. So aquanaut, it's kind of like astronaut, except we're living underwater. And there's actually been more people that have gone into space than have lived underwater. Like I said, I feel that art and science are very connected. Um, this is a photo of me and my fellow aquanaut, Liz. Underwater, the habitat we were living in is a shadow in the corner. And I was upside down in this photo because those helmets we were breathing from were pretty heavy and we'd be diving sometimes eight hours a day. So every so often I'd give my head a break and let it fall to the seabed and let my legs float up. Um, and it was, what I was doing here was 
and why I was underwater was because I helped adapt this ultra high speed camera for the underwater environment. That's the camera right there. So what's special about this camera is that it can film events that happen really fast in really slow motion. It films at up to 18,000 frames per second, whereas our eyes see at around 30 frames per second, or the slow motion setting on an iPhone is only 240 frames per second. So what I saw when my head was literally in the sand, just staring at a patch of pretty bland sand for I don't know, 30 seconds, I saw that I was staring eye to eye with this very well camouflaged mantis shrimp. So you can see the shrimp here. Every so often it'll fumble in its den. Its body is only about the diameter of a quarter. Now the mantis shrimp, we know it moves really fast, but the, um, the movements are too fast for the human eye to see. Here's a video of what the what was happening, and we can see it from the ultra high speed camera. Oh my god! Yeah. So the camera, that technology we built, let us see these things otherwise invisible to the human eye. Yep. Here's another video we filmed. This is um, a yellow-headed jawfish underwater. It's puking up sand. It does this to clean its den every so often underwater and this movement is it's also invisible to the human eye we have to use the high-speed camera to see what's happening get up i just don't want to watch it here's another photo of that habitat we were living in it's the aquarius habitat it's about the size of a yellow school bus and there were six of us living in there so it's pretty cozy here's a slightly more realistic photo of it, it some people say, oh, it looks dirty, but actually it's just, it's covered with marine life. It's become part of the reef. It's covered with algae and coral. It's been underwater for 25 years, and this is very, this is a good thing. It's amazing the technology has held up so well. This is what it looked like when it was brand new, shiny yellow. Um, so when we, when we were living underwater, we could spend as much time as we wanted at the depth we were living, so at about 60 feet. But before we could return to the surface, we had to, it's called decompress for about 18 hours. And to do that, we spent a few hours breathing pure oxygen from these masks. I know we look really freaky. <laughs> but, um, and then we came back to the surface after that. Um, I would, so a lot of people ask me, I mean, it, a lot of people ask me if I was scared from this. But no, I would go back in a heartbeat. I, I absolutely, really enjoyed the time underwater and we were really busy we were running about five different research experiments um, i absolutely loved what i was doing and i also wasn't scared for safety we went through so many training exercises so that we felt prepared to deal with any imagine um in any imaginable emergency situation like in our sleep um now i'm going to tell another story from underwater so we were living underwater with these um, giant fish. They're called Goliath grouper. And they can be like 200, 300 pound fish. There's the fish next to my head. So you can just tell how massive they are. And as we're divers in the water, we can feel like a boom in our chest when they feed. And there's a theory that what's happening is that the, the grouper is moving its powerful jaw so fast that it pushes away water inside its mouth and forms a small bubble that collapses instantaneously. That's the theory, at least, what's for what's happening. So we wanted to try to film that bubble forming, if it forms, with that ultra high-speed camera. And even though we got so close to the grouper, it took us a few days for the grouper to feel comfortable around us and to make eye contact like this. Um, we got the, the boom happened right in front of my fellow Aquadot Liz, but we didn't have the camera set up and we realized the camera would have to be like in the grouper's mouth. So that technology still needs to be developed. It's still an open question. For the, for the classroom in Florida, this is, should be really relevant to you too. Those, these Goliath grouper are really special creatures around there. Um, your classroom might know they've been talk of letting, um, opening up fishing again to the Goliath grouper, even though they're still, endangered 
Um, so then, like I said, art and science are connected. So all the film footage we took um, from the ultra high speed camera underwater, we had footage of I think of over um, a couple dozen different species. We put it together in an exhibit um, that featured at MIT. Of it was the first exhibit of ultra high speed underwater photography, and I like this because it's a connection again of art and science. Now, back to, to present day. So I just submitted my PhD thesis about, I guess, four weeks ago now. And um, so I spend most of my time in, in Oxford. That's where I was doing my um, PhD work. And the thesis is on building 3D models of coral reefs. This is a really gorgeous 3D model of a reef in Hawaii made from a couple thousand photographs of the reef. Um, this was compiled by my collaborator called the Hydros. And we're really interested in these 3D models of the reef because they let us under study, understand and study their relationship between fish and the, the architecture of the reef. We know that um, reefs provide a lot of hiding places for fish and a certain type of surface area for food to grow on. And this is important because reefs, they, they host over 25% of all marine life, but they cover less than 1% of the seafloor. That means they're like the mega cities of the ocean. They're really important for a healthy ocean. Um, and part of the reason why they're able to do that is because they have this gorgeous 3D structure that we're trying to understand better. Okay, now I need to reveal why I'm in Kansas. <laughs> so um, in Kansas, a place that's pretty much equidistant in the middle of the US from either ocean, we are, we're refurbishing a deep sea submarine. It's called the Pisces 6 submarine. And um, it was originally built in the 70s and we were bringing back it back into commission. So the submarine will help us explore, it'll bring us down to the deep sea to about 2000 meters. Um, I, I would, I wanted to take the camera out into the shop to show you what's all happening, but there's absolutely no cell phone service or Wi-Fi out there. So instead, just this morning, I took some photos of the shop. Um, I'll just go ahead and show you. Yeah, this is the submarine, um, that white sphere that holds three people and I'll safely transport them to the deep ocean. Um, here's some more photos of it. So the top photo shows more what the submarine will look like once it's all finished. You can see um, the size and then there's a picture of the crew of us at the bottom. Yeah, we've been working on this for, I don't know, maybe nine months now. Oh, oh um, here's some of the history of the submarine. You can see with one of the original drawings of the sub, what it was supposed to look like. And then a photo from when it was operational and I think this is from the 70s or 80s and then I love this final photo which shows the submarine on the back of a truck being transported into the middle of Kansas. So we're in Kansas because the submarine's owner and his family's all here and he's lived here for a while but as soon as it's ready to hit the water we'll, we'll obviously bring it to the ocean. Yeah. So those are those are um, the stories I wanted to share today. Now I would love to take um, any questions that you have. All right. Well, Grace, thanks for sharing that with us. I, I, we partner with that the Aquarius, and we do some hangouts there from time to time. And I, I can just imagine it's an amazing experience to live underwater and wake up every day and see the fish outside the window and and know you're going to spend your day hitting the water. It must be pretty exciting yeah yeah and I love to share my stories from from being underwater and share why I love the ocean so much I think um, right now too there's a um, what I haven't talked about is that there's some big um, problems facing the ocean from climate change to acidification to pollution like plastic pollution especially in the ocean and those are issues that we need solving we need the next generation to work on but I think people they don't care about those unless you you understand why the, the ocean is so wonderful and how important it is to our human life. Absolutely. And yeah. so before we meet some classrooms, Grace, I mentioned in the introduction that you spent uh, part of the summer uh, with NASA and 3D mopping, or mopping, 3D mapping <laughs> asteroids. Um, how did that relate to being 
under the water? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I said my, so my PhD research is on 3D map, 3D modeling coral reefs. And then NASA called our lab and I worked with them in the summer on 3D mapping asteroids in space. The two problems, they have some similarities. I mean, both both underwater and space are in a sense alien environments. They're both challenging environments to build technology for. And um, so there's there's some some overlap in the technologies developed, yeah. All right, excellent. Well, let's meet some of our classrooms because I'm sure they have lots of questions. And if there are any qu classrooms watching live on YouTube today, uh, use the YouTube chat sidebar, let us know where you're watching from and don't hesitate to send in a question. Yes. So here we go. Let's start with Mrs. Golchinski. Let's go to Dundee, Florida. She's got a third grade class with her. Let me turn your microphone on. Hey, grade threes, how you doing? Good, how are you? Hey, ask your question. Hey, Dundee, how are you doing? What kind of data do the robots collect? What kind of data do the robots collect? Yes. Great question. Um, we, they can collect all sorts of things. So I worked on um, a, a robot um, when I was an undergrad that made 3D maps of sea ice, um, sea ice underwater. So the, cam the robot would go underneath the sea ice and then um, a, an airplane would go on top. And together they'd map the thickness of the ice over time. And that's really important to know because it helps us adjust the weather models. Um, and predict the weather better. But also there's robots that search for oil. There's robots that just count fish because we wanna know how many fish are left in the ocean. There's robots that measure, measure acidification. There's robots that just map the seafloor so we know what are interesting places. There's robots that collect water samples so that we can do genetic analysis on the creatures that have been in the water. You can really build a robot to, to do anything you can think of. All right, great question. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to, let's go to Canada. Let's go to Ontario. Mrs. Ethereum's class, they're grade six, seven. They're joining us from Sarnia. Let me turn your volume up. How's it going today, Sarnia? Yep. Yep. Um, what's your favorite fish that you saw? <laughs> fish, I love. A damselfish. They are very territorial, so they they are, they're kind of small too, and so they'll they stay usually in one patch of the reef. And I love just sitting and watching them because they they really I imagine the fish as like a car in a city. They're really using all the nooks and crannies in the structure. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, Let's see, where should we go next? Let's go to Amherst View, Ontario, <laughs> grade six, seven. Mr. Richard's class, let me turn your mic on. All right, Mr. Hi, we actually class. Have, uh, hi, we actually have grade eights with us as well today. So we got a big oh, group. Great. Seven and eight, perfect. Yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll say hi. They're, they're all around. Yeah. Hi. 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 All right, Maya's got a question for you. Um. How long, like, do your air takes, like, eventually run out of air? And, like, how long could you stay underwater for without, like, refilling the air tank? Yeah. That depends on just how much air we bring down. So we could bring down, like, with that, that video from when I was dancing underwater, I was standing on top of our emergency air supply cylinders. So those cylinders were huge. They, could, they were, like, twice as long as I was and about as round. Um, so we had, and the air in the habitat was pumped in from the surface. So we could stay underwater for like a theoretically endless amount of time. Um, when I'm, you know, the size of a normal scuba tank bottle. No, I can't, not enough space. They're not too big. That, that can supply like more than an hour, two hours of air at depth. So it turns out if I was just bringing that tank on the surface, I'd have several hours, but the deeper I bring it, the less time I have on the scuba tank. Um, usually what's the limiting factor for the time we spend underwater, it's not our air supply, but instead it's the, the, the limits of how much um, tiny bubbles of gas our bodies can absorb. All right. That's good <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. And okay. the way I've always had it explained with scuba tanks is it's like 
picture yourself in your bathroom and then squish the air down, compress it, uh -huh. and that's about how much air goes into a scuba tank, which is pretty cool. Oh, yeah, that's a good analogy, yeah. All right, awesome question. Let's see. Let's go visit Mrs. Gonzalez's class. They're grade five. They're in San Antonio, Texas. Let me turn the volume up on your microphone. How's it going, San Antonio? Hi. Hi. Question is, did you robot or do you control it with Bluetooth? Or no control? I missed um, the first part of the question. So you said, do we control it with Bluetooth? No control, or what was the other one? Um, you program it. Or you program it. We'll do, we'll do all of those things. Um, underwater, the normal, like, cell phone service and GPS don't work underwater. Um, Bluetooth will work for only really close ranges underwater. So we have to be a bit more clever with how we're programming stuff. So we'll either have, we can have a wire come down or a tether come down from the surface, connect to the robot, and that can transmit as many signals as we want. Or we'll have the whole thing be autonomous, so have it make its own decisions. Yeah. And All what's right. your question? Let me turn their microphone back on. There you go. How do you make your robots waterproof? Waterproof. That's a really, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, we just, we have to make the seals properly. We actually, as much as we can, we try to not have to make stuff waterproof. So we want to make it fine for water to flow over it. Problem is though, electronics, really don't work in salt water. Anyone will know if you've ever like dropped a phone <laughs> in the ocean or underwater. So those we will waterproof, we'll surround them with air or oil actually. And then, I don't know, it's just like you think like making really tight seals. We have, it's called a rubber O-ring. Those are really key tool in ocean engineering because they make a nice seal. The nice thing is that the deeper you go underwater, the the tighter your seals get, so the less likely water is going to leak in um, because you have so much pressure closing the, the seals. Um, but we just have to test stuff over and over again to make sure it's just right. So a nice way to test for any water leaking is to put whatever you think is waterproof and put it like in a bathtub and see if there's any bubbles that come out. Because if there's a steady stream of bubbles, that probably indicates that air is being replaced with water inside. All right, well, we're going to move to another part of Texas. This time we're going to go to Dallas with uh, Mrs. Elliott's grade six classroom. Let me turn your microphone on. <coughs> hey, grade sixes. Hi. 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 How long on average would designing robots take Say that again. What, how long does designing, building, and deploying a robot take? Yes. For the ocean? Yes. Ooh, that's a hard one to answer. It depends on how big the team is and what the problem is. I've seen robots get built, you know, in like a couple of weeks. There's a really cool company called OpenROV that makes underwater robots that you can build at home. They're like the size of a lunchbox. And those you could build like in two days. Uh, a much bigger, so then there's also robots though that are the size of like a car and those can take months to, of years to make. Another thing too is that after you built the robot and tested it a few times, you're probably always going to make changes and improvements and upgrades to this robot system. So in one sense, it's also like never done. All right. And let's visit yeah. our final live classroom. Um, Mrs. Saldivar's class, they are in Anaheim, grade six classroom. Let me turn your microphone on. All right, oh, Anaheim. Uh, Hi, Anaheim. <laughs> um, how do you keep the pressure when you go deep underwater from crushing the submarine? And also what inspired you to be an engineer? Yeah, thanks. I'll answer the first one. That's a it's something we think a lot about. We'll do simulations for all of the shapes underwater and test them at high pressure before we ever put humans inside of them. Essentially, it's just a very strong um, shape and material. So that sphere that I showed you, spheres are really great for high pressure because the pressure hits each point about equally. 
And that sphere is, I mean, it's like this thick, the walls are about that thick, and it's made of um, uh, a very strong type of metal. Um, so yeah, there's been submarines that have been like hit by sharks or other marine animals. They're super, super strong. We also test it too. We'll test it to, um, to far deeper than we'll actually be diving it to make sure that it's safe. And then what inspired me to become an engineer? I think I always liked my math and physics classes in school. Those were my favorite classes. And then I joined robotics team in high school and I just thought it was really fun. I really liked the process of designing and building, testing robots. Um, so then I, I kept with it in undergrad and now I absolutely love what I do. I can't imagine doing anything else. Perfect. And that's such, such a good point that for your career, especially at this age to be thinking about what you love and what you like to do because you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life. So it better be something that you love and you're passionate <laughs> about and you're excited to get up for every day. Yeah. Yeah, and then engineering, so not all schools have like engineering as classes yet. Although I've heard some are doing com like computer coding classes as early as second grade. Yeah, if you can learn to code or practice coding, um, I think that's a really nice entry into engineering. All right, well, let's uh, visit some of the classrooms again because I'm sure they have more questions. So let's do it this way. I can see you all on my screen. So if you have a question in your class, give me a wave or come up to the camera and that'll be my signal to pick your class and we'll get another question for Grace. And there we go. We got a shirt popping up already in Mrs. Golchinski's class. Let me turn the mic on. Go ahead. How long was your um, dad or grandpa working for the chocolate? <laughs> How long was my grandfather working for the chocolate factory? He started it when he was, I don't know, like when he was young and then through, he worked on it his whole life, the chocolate factory. And then my grandmother um, was working at the chocolate factory. And now my uncle runs, um, runs the chocolate factory in Ohio. So it's been three generations. All right. And still making chocolate. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you bring any of it down in the bottom of the ocean with you? No, but that's a good idea. We will. It's cold at the bottom of the ocean too, so it's, uh, they won't melt, which is good. Perfect. Uh, let's see. I think I see some in Mrs. Therian's class. Let me turn your mic on. Oh, yeah, they're waving. I'm going first. How do you get in and out of your, like, underwater house thing? Yes, that's a good question. So... I guess a lot of people like people say, is there like a system of water air locks? But no, it's actually really, really simple. Um, the the door to the habitat is just a hole in the bottom of the habitat. Um, the air pressure inside keeps the water level down. So the analogy I always use is it's like a bucket flipped upside down and pushed underwater. So if you could imagine doing that, it'd be really hard to push the bucket upside down with air pocket inside. But if you have enough force bringing it down, there's that just this bubble of air essentially trapped by the habitat. Yeah, it's called the moon pool. Yes, and if you, I'm sure if you search YouTube, you can look up Aquarius. You can see that we've done a few hangouts where divers have come uh, up from the moon pool. It's pretty exciting. Pretty neat. Yeah. All right. Let's yeah, see. true. Classrooms have come and joined from Aquarius and from, yeah, from the habitat. You can see people just crossing that air water boundary. It's cool. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Elliott's class. I see a hand. Here we go. What do you eat under the water? What do we eat? We ate food pretty similar to astronauts in the sense that we had a lot of freeze dried food. Um, we did have a pizza delivered one evening which was lovely but um this because we were we were spending a lot of time like working underwater so uh we would be burning a lot of calories and we just got these freeze-dried meals that we had water to and would eat them in the habitat yes i remember uh, my classroom had a hangout with aquarius and i think the meals were getting tiresome to some especially <laughs> fabian who yeah like food a little more so <laughs> yeah fabian's a french um a frenchman yeah he's a grandson of jacques Cousteau. he has a bit more refined taste in food or more appreciation but he was absolutely fine but i think i was bothered a bit less because i just come out of college 
used to kind of eating on a budget or maybe quicker yeah, meals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember one of my favorites was freeze-dried lasagna. So the bag, it just looked like powder, and then I poured water into it, and it became like pretty much like lasagna. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go back to Anaheim. I see someone at the camera in Mrs. Saldivar's class. Yeah, um, when do you think the summer will be done? When do I think it'll be done? <clears throat> we, yeah. We've just been talking about that. We went over our engineering plans like yesterday. I wish I could show you our, our Gantt chart of the whole thing. It'll probably be a year... Um, to a nine months to a year before it hits the water. Um, first we do, we do pressure tests. So with no humans, the submarine goes into a test chamber that brings it down to more than our maximum pressure to make sure it's safe. And once it passes all those, then we start sea trials and we'll do probably 50 dives as practice dives um, before using the submarine for science. So, yeah. All right, very cool. And I hope that when that time comes, that uh, either I can get down there or we can do a hangout from the sub because that would be really cool to that do. That would be really awesome. We should try to do that. Or from, yeah, we should do that. All I don't right. think the technology really exists to do like a live stream from the ocean. Probably not from below, but maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe before it's launched on the deck. Yeah, before something. it's launched on the deck, which would be really cool. Totally, oh. let's do it. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Mr. Richard's class, I know you've got a big yeah. group. Do you guys have another question? Yep. Yeah. Good idea. Um, what is the main contributor to the coral being destroyed? The main contributor to the coral being destroyed? There's yeah. a f there's a few issues happening simultaneously. Um, it's one is um, the warming of the ocean, so the ocean's becoming warmer, and the coral can't deal with that. To acidification in the water because the ocean is ab absorbing carbon dioxide, um, the ocean's becoming more acidic. And think of it like coral is made of that calcium carbonate, like chalk. It'll it's starting to crumble from the acidification. Another aspect is overfishing. We've taken too many fish from the ocean, and that means is that the fish aren't there to keep the ecosystem in balance. Fish are really needed on the coral reefs to help clean the reefs from algae and other. Um, aspects and then another problem is pollution i mean almost every dive i go on unfortunately i'll see trash underwater very recognizable like plastic bags bottles cans and those can harm the marine life which in turn really disrupts the the balance of the ecosystem so i think those are the four main things affecting the coral right now all right and one more trip to mrs gonzalez's class let me turn your microphone on um, when you started your job of engineering, did you think that you would accomplish where you're at now? No, I didn't know. I When I joined the robotics team, I knew I, re I really liked it. We had a good time, but I didn't really know what careers were possible in engineering. Um, and then, and I guess I'm still learning as I go, too. But no, I didn't think I would be underwater. I know I loved being by the ocean. I love being on the beach. I liked scuba diving and sailing. Um, and I'm so glad I could mold those two passions together. But engineering is also, it's very diverse too. And I think people don't realize it's very collaborative um, engineering. I always thought I'd meet engineers kind of like Iron Man who like work alone in basements. But I mean, I've been at MIT, I've worked at CERN, like I would have found those people and I, nobody works like that. It's a, it's a very collaborative field. All right. And Grace, what's next for you? You've got the submarine on the go. Do you have anything else on yeah. the horizon? Yeah, I'm focused on the submarine right now. Um, and then I will be, I'll be in Washington, D.C. in a few weeks chatting at Nat Geo. I'll be back at MIT um, looking at a lab there and then I'll, I'll start a postdoc soon. So I'll continue research. All right, so a busy schedule. Yes. Um, are you, I know you were finishing up your PhD in the UK. Are you based more in the US now or do you head back to the UK? I'll be, I'm going to be based in the US. I'll be back to the UK at least once or twice. I have to, st I still have to defend my thesis. Um, so yeah, I'll sit in front of two examiners and defend the thesis. That'll be in about a month's time. But then I'll probably move back to the States. <laughs> 
All right. Well, we can probably squeeze in one or two more questions from classrooms. And I see some yeah. dancing in Mrs. Styrian's class. So let's turn their microphone on. It looks like they're ready. Yeah. Is it our turn? Yeah, I think so. Um, how, wait, no? yes. yes. How did dance help you underwater? How did dance help me underwater? Um, I think dance, so it, in the company I was with, it helped me learn to, to work in a team, work as a, as a company. And then also when I'm dancing, I notice you, you learn how to focus on your weaknesses, but also um, but also on all your strengths and your weaknesses and you learn to be inspired by the people around you. It's really easy, I think, to get jealous of like a dancer who has you know, higher developes or, or like a better turnout, which is fine, but it, and it's good to use that as kind of inspirational energy, but you won't get any, you won't become better unless you focus on your own improvements too. So there's finding that balance and that I learned in the dance studio and that I think I apply all the time in engineering and on the team projects I'm working on. And then, then another aspect is working, working hard towards a goal um, that dance taught me with that. I think you can learn that from a number of different sports and activities too. All right, back to Florida. I can see someone in a nice, Bright red shirts. Let me turn the mic on. <laughs> no, we're done. Yeah. How are y'all using forces? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. How are we using forces? Yeah, we've we've been studying forces and how scientists use forces. Are you learning. Learning. Oh, cool. Like forces, like um, like gravity. Yeah, any force. Any force. Yeah, we use it all the time in engineering design. Oh, I wish I was. I was reading a um, ocean engineering text yesterday about submarines, and we have to map the submarine. We map the center of buoyancy, and we map the center of gravity. We need to make sure that they're pretty close because if buoyancy and gravity are way off, the submarine's gonna be moving around all the time. So we map. We do like free body diagrams. I don't know if you all are doing that. Yeah, in physics, we'll map that for really any system we build. Um, when I'm learning, and when you're, I'm learning physics and engineering, you can you use simple shapes to learn, so like a circle, and you'll pick where the center of all the forces are. But now, with more complex machines, we build a 3D model of what we're working on, and the computer will help us determine exactly where the center of the forces are and how things will behave with different forces. All right. And we will give final question to Anaheim. I see one more person up at the camera. How long does it take to be a sea explorer? How long does it take? You could, I would say it could take like five minutes. I mean, you could start wherever you are and you don't even need to be right on the ocean. Like these guys in Kansas, they're, they're diving in lakes. They're looking at lakes. Actually, in reservoirs here, so they look like lakes. They um, there's whole sunken towns, um, because they 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 evacuated the town and let the reservoir flow over them. So there's just there's fascinating stuff you can see even in the middle of Kansas or really wherever you could start exploring right now. Even if you and even if you don't see actual water, there's um. Bob Ballard's group has the online video streams from their deep ocean rover. Um, and you, you can, peep, there's not enough time for any one person to look at all of that video footage. So I think they've had some examples of people, just anyone looking at the, at the video and finding some really cool stuff. Yeah. So I'd say five minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. Great point and good examples. Another cool one is Google Earth. They've got some oh, yeah. great, uh, where they've taken the 3D cameras underwater and you can check out different reefs um, and find a lot of cool stuff there. And if you search around, uh, there are some really cool 3D uh, underwater experiences you can find. So yeah. you're right. It doesn't take very long and you can explore the ocean, take part in citizen science right from your computer. But yeah. I think you'd agree with me that getting out into the water is pretty fun. It does help, yeah. And if you want to follow along to the submarine project, we have a Facebook and an Instagram page. You just look at, it's called Pisces and then space VI. Um, so Roman numeral six, Pisces VI, that's the submarine. And you can follow along the progress there. 
Perfect. Well, Grace, thank you so much for hanging out with us today uh, from Kansas and thank telling you. us a little bit about um, what you've been up to and some of your adventures. And uh, I know the classrooms had a good time. So thank you very much. And obviously, best of luck with the new adventures to come. Oh, thank you. Thank you for letting me be part of your classroom today. Thank All you. right. Well, we, a couple of classrooms had to duck out for their lunch, but let me turn on the microphones uh, of the classrooms with us and let them say goodbye and thank you nice and loud. Here we go. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, classrooms. We're going live with a hangout with the Sedna Epic team in about 15 minutes. If you want to check that out. Otherwise, have a great day. And thanks for hanging out today. Thank you, Joe.